So with me now is a man that played 357 times for Everton, including 97 goals. Make that 98 if you include the second, the first free kick against Ipswich. Um, he also scored Ireland's first ever goal at a World Cup finals and also featured for them during the Euros. So, Kevin, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to speak with such a legend. Um, how are you holding up during the whole coronavirus lockdown? Um, well, I've, it's, I've had an ankle replacement operation the, the first week in February. So I was in plaster for three weeks and I was in a boot for three weeks. So I was housebound anyway. So it's not really mm. affected me as, as much as what, what it has other people. Oh, nice. It's, it's not the uh, not the trusty left peg, is it? It's the, it's the right one, actually. Is it the front. right one? Yes. <laughs> That's good. And so I, I was just curious, like, especially for someone like yourself who's had a long career in sport, like, these are certainly unprecedented times and very unusual. Um, I think you've got to give credit where credit's due. Um, Liverpool have been by far the best team in the country this season um, and they would have already won it by now had it not been for, for the lockdown. I was just curious, what is it like in the dressing rooms of the of the champions-elect during this time of season? Because obviously you've won two championships yourself with Evan. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a dressing room full of confidence. You know, you've got... Uh, you know, you, you know you're the best team in the league. You don't fear playing against anybody. And um, as you said, I mean, they've, you know, they've been the best team by far this this year, this year so this season. And, uh, you know, obviously it'd be down to the government if they uh, if they decide to, to start the Premier League again. Yeah. Then, and not many men have made that move from uh, across Stanley Park, which obviously you did um, as a youngster. Um, I imagine that comes with a, a very unique pressure. And my question is, how do you think you thrived under that so well? Um, well, I spent four seasons at, uh, at Liverpool, um, played mostly in the reserves, and we had a really good reserve team in that in that era. Uh, we won the Central League four years on the trot, and it was a, a proper reserve league. You know, if you um, if you didn't play, if you were in the first team squad in those days, it was only one sub, two subs. Uh, so if you didn't, if you were in the squad, you played on a Saturday three o'clock. So if the first team were playing uh, West Brom away, you'd play West Brom at, at home at Anfield, and uh, you know you were playing against first team players. So the the gap between the, f- the reserves and the first team wasn't uh, as great as, as say maybe it is now. Um, and I, I was training with world class players day in day out. So even though uh, I made a few, only made a few appearances to Liverpool, um, I left Liverpool a better player and I was, you know, ready and equipped to, you know, for, for playing at the top level. Definitely. And how did that move come about? Because obviously Howard Kendall uh, at the time, I mean, when he'd originally come into to Everton, I mean, obviously I wasn't, I wasn't alive in there to see it, but from what I've heard, especially during those early days when he just come in, there was quite a lot of pressure around him, the club and his position. So I was just curious, uh, how did that move come around? Um, well, I was in, in digs in, in Elsie Road, which is just around the corner from both uh, Anfield and Goodison. And on a midweek, um, I used to go and watch Everton, uh, watch their home games. Uh, and I saw the team that Howard was putting together. I saw Graeme Sharp make his debut. Uh, Adrian Heath signed from Stoke for 750000 uh, Kevin Ratliff. So I could see the sort of side that... Um, that Howard was putting together and it was the, the last game of the season um, my fourth season and my contract was got due to expire so in those days I was able to, to choose which club I wanted to and uh, the day before the final game of the reserve season I was playing for Liverpool reserves away at Preston and on the Friday in my digs um, I got a phone call of um, a pressman Colin Wood who worked for the, the Daily Mail and he said would I be interested in signing for Everton I said, yes. I thought it was a wind-up. I thought it was one of the players winding me up sort of thing. And he said, well, put the phone down and Howard Kendall will ring you. Uh, sure enough, put the phone down. 30 seconds later, uh, Howard, the boss, uh, rang up and said that uh, he was interested in signing me. Uh, he was going to come along and watch me play for, for Liverpool Reserves against Preston and, um, you know, do the best that I could. So I must have done OK because uh, a few days later I got a phone call uh, from Harry Cook, who was the chief scout, to, to go to Belfield to, uh, to sign for Everton. Oh, that, that's fantastic, and I think that's a, a testament to Howard and the relationship that, that he could have with people, because you wouldn't really hear of a relationship between a manager and someone of the press like that these days, really. Um, I had the opportunity uh, late last year to speak with some of your teammates at the premiere of, of the film dedicated to Howard, 
Um, uh, speaking with Derek Mountfield, I, I, I quizzed him um, on the amount of goals he scored, especially during that eighty four eighty five season. Because I think he was in, you know, he was in high double figures, which is absolutely insane for for a centre half. And um, you know, we paid tribute to you. He said, when he, when you've got the likes of you and Trevor Stephen um, playing balls into the box, and you've got the likes of you know Gray, Sharp, Heath, and himself making runs, it's virtually impossible not to find yourself on the score sheet. So I was just curious. If you could take your pick out of the players, that, the attacking players that you played with during your time with Everton, uh, to be in the box and you, for you to be swinging a ball into the box, if you could take your pick, who would it be to be on the other end? Um, well, just to go back to, to Derek, I mean, um, he was a, a natural goal scorer for a centre-half. And when we used to get free kicks, if I was taking them, Derek was always the first one on the move. So I always, I was always looking out for Derek. And, and sure enough, he'd make the first run across defenders. So uh, I think the... The semi-final goal against Luton, where he scored a free off uh, my free kick, I think that sums it up. I was looking for him, and I managed to put the ball on on it, and it was a great header. So, uh, you know, Derek was really uh, a marksman in those days, and you know, I think that was a, a big help because when you win the league, you have to have uh, a lot of players who can score goals. You're not reliant on just one or two players to score like your strikers. So, um, it was the same in uh, probably. If I was putting a cross in, in the air, uh, Sharpie out of the strikers, we had a, a great understanding where he was going to run. He'd either get, get across the defender or he'd look as if he's going to get across the defender and he'd pull off behind him. So I had, a, I had an understanding of where his actual his movement was. Um, I was fortunate to play with a lot of um, great strikers, uh, but probably the pick of them for me uh, would have been Adrian Heath. Um, you know, because he was only small in stature, but his movement, uh, again, I could play one touch football into him because I knew exactly whether he wanted it short. He'd come, he'd go long to come short or he'd come short to go long. Uh, so just had a really telepathic understanding with, with Inchi. Uh, but as I say, Andy Gray, you know, you just put the ball in the box and, you know, fearsome uh, and he'd get on the end of it, you know. And, you know, uh, Gary Lineker, I mean, he scored 40 goals for us. Uh, Sharpie scored 27 that season, uh, but we finished runners up in the, the league and runners up in the FA Cup. So, you know, and we didn't get enough goals from other positions in that year to actually, you know, do the double. So, uh, but out of all the strikers, as you say, I think uh, I put in she just slightly ahead of the others. That's certainly interesting. Uh, you know, with the, the elite talent that you played with, that's a, that's a huge credit to, to Inchi. Um, I know you touched on the, the 85-86 season there, which I, I hope to talk about later. But just on that, I suppose the start of things from 80, uh, the 83-84 season to, you know, the season where we did the double. Um, speaking with the likes of Peter Reid, Andy Gray, Graham Sharp, I asked them to uh, take their pick of the bunch. Of their um, of their their triumph. So, if you could take your pick out of you know the the FA Cup win against Watford, the uh, win in the league the following season, or of course the the European Cup winners' cup of which you know you scored in the final. If you could pick one of those campaigns as your favourite, what would it be? Um, I think the the first championship in eighty five. I think as a young lad growing up, you you aspire to be a player. Um, and, you know, the best team always wins the league. There's no fluke in that, you know, over the course of the season, the best team with it wins it. And, you know, that, that team in 85, I mean, before the game, you're getting changed in the dressing room and depending on the opposition. You knew if everyone played to maybe 60, 70%, depending on the opposition, you know you'd beat them. Obviously, the better the teams, the better your performances had to be. Um, and I think that season, 85, I think the performance against Man United at home, where we beat them. Know. 5-0 um, and they, they were a top team at, and we just destroyed them. They got away with 5 nil. it could have been 8 or 9 easily. Uh, that was, you know, anybody says to me, what was the best team performance I'd played in? Uh, that would certainly be, you know, uh, highly, highly right up there. Yeah, and you managed to get on the score sheet twice, so that was an absolutely fantastic result that I, I still hear about today when I'm talking to, you know, family and all the friends of that generation. Um Another another sort of key moment of that season that often gets brought up and it is heralded as Goodison's greatest night is um, that semi-final second leg against Bayern Munich. Um, I've heard many stories from in the stands and, uh, and certain players of, of their experiences of that night. Uh, I've just wondered, you know, what were your thoughts and feelings in that dressing room and, and did you realise at the time it was going to be such a significant night in the club's history? Um, we don't at the time, you know, it's a special night. Any European night at Goodison 
uh, with the floodlights is, is a fantastic experience. But certainly, uh, you know, just on the team best going, you know, getting around Goodison, it was just it was just rammed outside, and you just knew from then it was going to be a special night. Uh, coming out, you know, coming up the steps to to go out to the warm up. Uh, again, it was just electric, but actually coming out for the the, the kickoff. Uh, once you hit the top step and you're out into the the Goodison atmosphere. You know, I've I've been fortunate to play in big games all over the world. But if anybody said to you, "What's the best atmosphere you've ever played in?" That would be that night. You know, it's really um, it was fifty five thousand more than that probably. They're all Evertonians, and it was just you know we 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 went behind just before half time, uh, and you could hear a pin drop. It was just silence. You know, when the ball hit the back of the net. Um, but the good thing was the second half. Uh, we were kicking towards the Gladys Street. Uh, we always tried to do that. Ken Ratliff as a skipper, uh, you know, we always used to try and kick to the park end first half and then kick to the Gladys Street because they, uh, and at the half time, Howard just said those those uh, famous words, you know, just get at them and just, you know, the Gladys Street will suck the goals in. And certainly that second half performance, you know, was, was, uh, was was it was the final? I mean, you know, we beat Rapid Vienna, but that was the actual final in that second half performance. You know, and they were a top t- top team. They'd won the Bundes. Well, they went on to win the Bundesliga that year. Um, and we just you know, Sharpie got the first goal. Um, you know, brought the house down. Andy Gray got the second goal. And I always remember the third goal. I, I had the ball in the left back position, and I was waiting for Andy to make a run. And you've got 55,000 people shouting, man on, sort of thing, like, you know, so you, you have to hold your nerve at times. And I played the ball, waited for Andy, played it into his path. Uh, he played it square to Trevor Stephen uh, and a brilliant finish. And that was game set and match. And uh, again, when the ball at the back of the net, the, the atmosphere and the noise at Goodison was, was unbelievable. And it was a, a fantastic memory to treasure. Yeah. And uh, that run by yourself, uh, watching it back today, is absolutely brilliant. The way you just glide past players just, just effortlessly. Almost. Um, I was wondering because obviously you mentioned there Trevor Stephen on the other side of the, on the other flank, and he's a tremendous talent in England international. Um, compared to the modern game now, you, you'd almost be classified as wide midfielders rather than wingers. So I was just curious from from Howard and obviously Colin Harvey as well, who is assistant coach. Um, what did they expect from from you as wide players? Um. They expected um, quality at some stage in the game. Um, you know, Trevor, you always knew he was going to beat the full-back and get across in, so I, that's why I scored so many goals, because I was I was always ready to get in the box, because I had uh, the boss gave me that licence. He knew I could score goals, so he was more interested in my going forward and attacking players as, as regards to my defensive side of the game. You know, he always had a, he always had a good left back behind me because that allowed me to, to actually, you know, get, get into the box and create and score goals. Um, so, yes, but, but Trevor, I mean, as a modern player, um, he, he was just, uh, he was just, uh, a great athlete, really technically, never gave the ball away. And he had Gary Stevens behind him, who was who, who could have run for, for England. He was an absolute athlete, and those two getting up and down the right hand side uh, was a, was a big part of our success. And obviously, um, you know, the left hand side. So we, we we were encouraged to more or less stay wide, uh, and let's you know when Reedy and Brace were together, uh, they 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 win the, the ball and they just supply to to myself and to and to Trevor. So we had a we had a great understanding. Everyone knew their roles, uh, but I have to say that uh, Howard Kendall, the boss. Uh, was a great man manager. Uh, he gave me 100% confidence. Uh, I wasn't frightened of making mistakes because he had he had that much faith in me. He knew I could create or could score a goal, uh, and that was a big part of, uh, of me being able to be you know play play with freedom. Fantastic. And you mentioned there, obviously, Gary Stevens, Trevor Stephen was almost concrete down the down the right hand side. What I found quite unusual about that season was the changeover of left back. From John Bailey to Pat Van Den Howe. I was just wondering, did that cause you to make any alterations in your game or did you improve? Um, well, Pat was a sort of right, right footed uh, left back. So I always knew he'd, he was going to cut inside, but he'd always like supply me uh, with his right foot. So, and he was, a, he was an excellent defender. I mean, Pat could play left back, right back, centre back, uh, and he was a real solid defender. So, again, that encouraged me. To, to be able to get forward and, and Pat was a great athlete the same as Gary where he could you know he could run run for fun and he was a real strong strong defender in 1v1 situations Brilliant um, and that, now obviously you said that 
the uh, the semi final against Bayern Munich felt as if it was the the final itself again as Rapid Vienna were you know they didn't have a patch on us really and to the credit you obviously scored that winning goal in, in Everton's only European final what's the what are the thoughts and feelings as you, as you put that ball in the back of the net um it was just um it happened really quickly I mean uh, we scored uh, Andy Gray scored the first goal um, Trevor Stevens scored from a corner I, I whipped in and it, we were cruising and it, but they had a striker at that time Hans Krankel and he was a prolific goal scorer and he just got half you know we, we'd switched off I think we our minds were probably cast towards the, the cup final against Man United on the Saturday because we were cruising and out of nothing Hans Krankel you know, scored um, and I think they were still celebrating a little bit uh, the ball got played up to Sharpie uh, he, he laid a great ball off to me and so I was just on the edge of the box and I could see their keeper sprinting out. So I just managed to, to dink it over him off the underside of the bar. And that was good. That was game set and match. So it, was, it, it put the game to bed. So we didn't really have any time after we went, to, you know, they scored. It was just straight down the other end and, and put the game to bed. So uh, that was a, another memorable moment for myself. And obviously to, to win a European trophy was, was brilliant. Definitely. And I've I've heard from my dad that it that it wasn't ideal having to make his way back from Rotterdam to Wembley in in such a short space of time, uh, which you it, you wouldn't really get these days. And um, what were your um? How did you cope physically with the the fixture congestion? As in those days, it, it fixtures just came to, seemed to come thick and fast. Yeah, it was just you just one big game after another. Um, and Howard was um, was a top manager. He, you know, he made sure that you know our our training was was uh, limited. You know, he wanted to say he's a big believer in saving saving players' legs. So for the likes of Peter Reid, Paul Bracewell, um, if they didn't fancy training on a Monday, he just let them go and just do a jog and stretch because he knew he just wanted to save their legs. Uh, come the games, whether it be midweek or Saturday. So, he, he, you know, he, he was really knowledgeable. It was just unfortunate, obviously. Um, it does take its toll a little bit. You play in a European final on a Wednesday. Uh, you travel back to Liverpool. I uh, got back the early hours uh, Thursday morning. You go home, rest up, and then on Friday, you're uh, you're off back down to Wembley. And I remember the final itself. The, it was an absolutely baking day. It was one of the hottest days of the year. Um, and it was, a, you know, it was a close game. And obviously... Uh, you, they went down to ten men, um, and then Norman scores a great goal. The only place he, you know, he could have beaten Neville with it. So it was, you know, it was a fantastic season when you look back. But obviously, it had the uh, the edge taken off a little bit by losing in the final to to stop a student treble, which you know, which we we were the worthy, we would have been worthy winners of a treble. Yeah, most definitely. And as as you touched on earlier, that we were we were bitterly unlucky the following season, as a, as I believe we had a, a double. It was basically wrapped up, and we had to sort of pull from underneath us almost. Um, we then, sort of in in true sort of championship team winning style, went and clinched it the following season. Would you say Liverpool taking the honours the following season spared motivation to to go and win it again in eighty seven? Um, I think so. It was bitterly disappointed. Obviously, we we had a good team um, that was capable of winning it, and uh, Liverpool just pipped us to the double. Um, but, you know, you look back, as I said before, uh, it was a different style of, of football we played in 86. With Gary Lindy to come in, he was more of a... He didn't really want the ball into feet. He was more of balls over the top to use his electric pace. Um, so he turned, you know, even if he put a, a ball over the top, it was a bad ball. He'd turn it into a good ball because he was just that electric and he was a goal scorer. So, you know, he scored 40 goals. He, he, he's done his job. He can't do any more. Sharpie, as I say, scored 27. But just because we played a longer style football... Uh, the midfield players like Trevor and myself were unable to to get up into supports as much. So um, I forget how many I didn't score that many goals that season. Trevor didn't, and when you look back, you know we fell short on on a, on a few more goals to 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 do the double. Mm, definitely. Have you got a sort of pick of the bunch in terms of your your moments uh, at Everton? Uh, as you'd say, as your sort of favourite moment during your your ten year stay at Everton. Um, it's difficult to to pick. Pick certain ones out. Obviously, as I said before, uh, winning your first uh, championship title—that you know, was that's that that was the big medal, uh, the European medal. Um, and as I mentioned before, the performance against Man United, um, and it's it just lots of you know big games and you know the players that you play with and uh, the, the, the camaraderie you have. You know, you'll always have that when we we catch up. You know, we have get-togethers and all that. We we, we still are, we we're still great friends. And I think that, that that helped us during that period where we, we were successful, that you've got the camaraderie both on the pitch and off the pitch. 
Yeah, definitely. And every, everyone, you know, everyone was on the same page as they were, you know, winning honours, major honours for the for the first time themselves. Um, for people like myself, I was born in 1998. Uh, the, the best comparison um, of, of, of my age to, to make to yourself is obviously Leighton Baines. Um, you know, absolute wand of a left foot, set piece specialist. Um, and he, he had a fantastic relationship with, with Stephen Pienaar down that left hand side, which is, you know, defining, particularly for people of my age. And you and Leighton Baines share in common the fact that you both scored two free kicks in one game. Uh, obviously, he scored two, both of them obviously being allowed against West Ham a few years ago. Um, you, unfortunately, got um, got that first one against um, Ipswich chalked off. I was just curious, what was the... Because um, I watched that free kick back, uh, both of them. What was the little interaction with Peter Reid before you take the free kick for the second time? Did he try and take that off you? No, it was... Um, I, the first one, I, I just got on the ball early. Uh, they, they were still lining the wall up, so I bent it in Paul Cooper's top right-hand corner. Uh, I was expecting referee disallowed it, which he did. Mm. And uh, as I was getting the ball, um, really sort of stepped in and more or less said, you know, what are we going to do now? So I can't really swear, but I told him just to get out of the way and I'll put it in the other corner. So um, I, I, I didn't realise at the time I'd done it, but I moved the ball back from the goal about a yard just to give me a bit more distance. Because even though the referees sometimes pace out 10 yards, you never get 10 yards in the wall. It's usually about eight yards. So I just thought, when I saw Paul Cooper, he just edged over to his right a little bit because he knew I could put it in his top right-hand corner. And he left a nice little space on his bottom left-hand corner. So I, managed, I knew if I got it off the, over the wall with a bit of spin away from the keeper, I'd have a chance to score. And so I executed it perfectly. And uh, you know it was a great when it hit the back of the net. And uh, a lot of Evertonians of that era, they they remember that goal very well. Yeah, I think I've had plenty of people, but obviously, like in my family, say that's their that's their favourite goal of yours. Mine, however, I've obviously uh, gone through videos, and it seemed like you only knew how to score good goals. To be honest, like the the goals are absolutely fantastic. Uh, my pick of the bunch is a, a certain free kick at the cop end in '87, which you. Uh, through, through the V sign up to the cop, uh, you made the habit of scoring against Liverpool in big games, which not many players do, particularly in my area. I know we got like uh, Romelu Lukaku and then going back to like Tim Cale. Would, would you just say those experiences from like 84, 85 just acclimatised you to the big games? I think so. I think um, you've got to have that mentality where you've got to have confidence and belief and confidence in yourself because you're not always going to going to score goals you're not always going to make a good pass you know there's times in games where things aren't going great but you've got to you know you've got to have that self-confidence and I think I've always had that uh, from my time as a young player I made my debut when I was 16 for Hereford um, you know in front of a full house at Edgar Street which was about 7,000 in those days uh, I made my second division debut against Fulham at Craven Cottage uh, against George Best, Bobby Moore, there's 28,000 people there. So you've got to be, you know, I, I've seen players over the years that are really good on a on a training ground, but put them put a crowd in front of them and they can't perform to the the same level. So I was to say, you know, you to play at the top level, you've got to be mentally strong. Yeah, was the it was the V sign just instinctual? Because I know Dixie Dean says when he used to slot at the cop end, he used to bow. Yeah, in front of them. <laughs> I, I never really, I never really thought about any. I, I didn't really have a, a signal or anything, but it was the, the free kick was the best I've ever hit. So yeah. I, as soon as it left my boots, I knew it was in because it was rising. It was right in the top corner. I couldn't, I couldn't have placed it any better. Um, but it, in those days, I mean, if, if you look at the, the footage, it was like half Everton, half Liverpool supporters in the cop in those days. So it was just, uh, I just went to the cop and, uh, as you do, just took the V's. So uh, <laughs> I mean, again, a lot of it, uh, and it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't anything detrimental against Liverpool or the cop or anything. That it was just something I did on the spur of the moment. Um, I don't know why, but it just happened, and it's one of the best things I did. <laughs> Definitely. Now, t 10 years uh, as, a, as a career um, at Everton Football Club, I know obviously you went on to, to Newcastle uh, and Blackpool, but 10 years is a very long time. Obviously, you joined in 82. Um, you've obviously seen a huge sort of turnover and change during that time because, as I said, I was born to the back end of the 90s, but um, from what I know, the, the 90s weren't too pretty for Everton. Um, how did you sort of observe the change over time? Um, I, it was it was diff difficult at times because you saw players of our great team leaving and players 
coming in to replace them, and no disrespect to them, but they weren't as good as the players that that, that was leaving. Um, I love playing for Everton, so um, I never really looked at, at moving away. I mean, my family was settled, uh, my kids were settled in school. Um, as I say, I love going into training at Belfield. Uh, I love playing for Everton. Um, so it was just, um, you know, as I say, it was just the turnover. Um, obviously, and not being, you know, getting banned from Europe uh, was a big um, turnaround for the for the club and the club's fortunes. If you look back from the team, I think it broke up too quickly. Mm. Um, and as I say, players came in that didn't take the, the club forward, and I think we went on a bit of a a bit of a, um, a downward turn, should we say? Yeah, um, I remember Neville Southall saying in the, in the film to Howard's way that we would have gone on to be the best team in Europe for the next five years or whatever the length it was that, that we, we were banned for. Do you, do you share that sentiment? I do. I mean, that's the biggest regret is, is not being able to, to play, you know, challenge for the, the European Cup. If we had a team that wasn't good enough to win it, then it wouldn't really be so bad. But to actually the team that we had, uh, I know it was Bayern Munich, as I say, we, we over two legs and they were a top team in Europe. We've proven we could, we could, we could do that. Um, so to not have the opportunity uh, to, to compete and, and try and win the European Cup, that's, you know, that's one of my biggest regrets in football. Yeah, but I can't imagine how, uh, how it makes a, a player in that team feel because as, as a fan that wasn't even born at that time, it makes me you know, really disappointed and angry, the fact that we didn't get the chance to, to realise our potential. But as you said, you see, you know, you, you really understood the club, you understood the values uh, and the morale and, and, you know, what's necessary to make Everton, Everton, as it were. Um, you, uh, you did return to the club as, uh, with the under-18s uh, and worked alongside Duncan Ferguson. Um, I was just curious, what have you made uh, of the sort of, because there's been, you know, huge turnover since your time at the club, because we seem to be in a continual phase of transition. Hopefully now it's stopped. But uh, you know, from from your time at you from your time at the club as a coach to now, what have you what what do you make of the direction that we're going in? Um, well, hopefully it's in a, in a forward direction. I mean, the, the club has backed the managers over the you know the last certainly the last three managers. You know, they've had the money to spend. Uh, whether you know we we have at times we haven't brought in Everton players, and I think sometimes people don't understand and get what it is to be an Everton player. Uh, the the crowd put huge pressure on you. And I've seen some of the players haven't been able to to handle that sort of pressure that's put on them. Uh, so you know, in the in the recruitment side of it, you've got to have you know good players, obviously, to, that can play for Everton. But they've got to be a certain type. You know, they've got to be mentally strong and be able to handle the pressure of and the expectation of what's required at Goodison Park and yeah. playing for Everton. Of course, definitely. And I mean, it, it seemed like now we finally sort of hit the nail on the head with the appointment of Carlo Ancelotti as a sort of man with pedigree who is just respected throughout the football industry as a whole. Do you think, in a way, that you could make comparisons to Howard Kendall in a sense, is just the, his aura and the respect that he commands? Yeah, I think, you know, a uh, fantastic appointment. He's a, a serial winner wherever he's been. Uh, he's had top players to work with. And um, he'll know, I mean, he's been at the club long enough now, to, he'll know what areas that he needs strengthening. And um, I'm sure if he can get the right players and attract the right players, then then he could be successful because, he, you know, he's got the knowledge, he's got the experience. And I've, you know, read things about, you know, what players who've worked under him, you know, that he's a, he's a great man manager, which how, that was Howard Kendall's, um, one of his biggest strengths was his, his way he could deal for, with players, the way players wanted to play for him. And um, Carlo, you know, seems to have the same same type of, um, you know, aura about him. So hopefully, you know, he can bring the same sort of success that uh, our boss did. Fingers crossed. I mean, what's it been now? 30 years. And I mean, it was 14 years until we won that that FA Cup in 84. I mean, it, it's been long enough. It'd be nice to see us pick up a, a piece of silverware soon. But uh, yeah, Kevin, uh, I just want to say thanks very much for your time. It's been, it's been an honour to speak to a legend like yourself and I hope you keep safe and well during this whole lockdown. Thanks very much, Max. Max, really enjoyed that. Okay, Pleasure. Stay safe. Pleasure. Take care, mate. Okay, cheers.